bless the name of the Lord. This is a great season of God moving all over the earth. I am amazed at the things that I'm hearing. I'm also amazed at the things that I am seeing. You may be seated. Over the last two weeks, it's been my great joy and privilege to uh, be invited to see some of the great things that God is doing and to have the opportunity to minister. First of all, in uh, Dallas, Texas, at the Sheraton Convention Center, there are 2,000 radical young leaders of um, spirit-filled groups on college secular campuses that came together. And uh, there's, I think you just saw that picture there. There's, there's I, I wish you could see, I wish you could see the whole room because it was just jammed. That conference center was just jammed. And I'm going to tell you, God did amazing things. What I discovered is that there were so many of those kids that are making a huge impact on the world through reaching college students. For instance, at Sam Houston State University, there's a young man he has 700 meeting every Thursday night at Sam Houston University. Uh, University of Texas, San Antonio. On and on the list goes. I met several who have 1,000 students meeting every week at colleges that are not large universities, but God is just moving by his power. And people are so hungry for the Holy Spirit, just so Hungry for the move of God. Also within the context of that ministry, there is a movement called Live Dead. Live Dead is where these wonderful, sharp, educated young people have given their lives to move to areas of the world where there, there is no gospel witness, absolutely no preaching of the gospel ever. And in some of these places, they've never heard the good news. I uh, ran into a little girl. I, honestly, she looked like she was 14. She's 25. She and her precious husband now uh, stationed and assigned in a former uh, uh, area of the Soviet Union that is 98% Muslim where the gospel is banned and prohibited, but yet they have gone there knowing that these moves could cost them their lives. Well, we had the greatest time. I preached um, two consecutive days, and it was just glorious to be there and to see all that God is doing. Colleen, Texas is, was my next stop at Destiny World Outreach Center, and I think we've got a, a picture of Colleen, Texas. Again, just a powerful, powerful move of the Holy Spirit. And Colleen, God is doing a work that's, that's absolutely astounding. And uh, this pastor and his precious wife, the Rose, Pastor Ms. Rowe, are connected to a network of men that are under um, a great bishop, Bishop Ivy Hilliard, and uh, met some of those uh, men from Florida and from uh, Seattle and other places, Atlanta. And the Lord just connected our hearts. It was a wonderful time. Now, the reason I'm showing you all this is not because I want you to know what I'm doing. It's because I want you to know what you're doing. The fact is, I don't carry an individual anointing. I carry a corporate anointing. Because everywhere I go, I am able to communicate the DNA of this church. And all I can tell you is, your prayers. This past week was one of the most powerful weeks of ministry I've ever experienced. And do you know why it was powerful? It was because we were filling this place on, on the mornings of last week for that six o'clock prayer meeting. I am convinced of it. We're going to continue that this week. Well, then I went to Keith Craft's church for a Wednesday, just went for a Wednesday night. And uh, that, I think that was the first, I think that was the very first night, uh, in fact, there you can see the crowd and what God's doing. Now, here's what's amazing. 
all of those people are being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, Pastor Keith estimated that after the three nights, we were only supposed to go one night. God moved in such an incredible way. We extended it a night, and then again it happened. The same thing happened. So we extended it another night, and then I will be going back for another midweek series in, in February, and then he's asked me to come in March because he understands that God is doing something so extraordinary there through the move of the Holy Spirit. He asked me last year to come in. He said, I just feel like uh, my people need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he said, I feel like that's a little bit more in your wheelhouse than it is mine. And he said, would you just come and assist me? I said, I'd be glad to. So I thought I was going for a Wednesday, end up the Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. I had mixed emotions. I wanted to be here every morning so badly in these prayer meetings. But how many of you know that when God's doing something like that, you got to listen? And so I stayed right there. And God did a remarkable thing. Pastor Keith said, and these are his uh, his statistics, he said that between 1,000 and 1,500 people, as far as he can tell, were baptized in the Holy Spirit during the last three nights. Amen. And I have another opportunity uh, that I really just feel like I need, um, I need to fulfill. Last year, I was asked to go to, the, to a conference in Zimbabwe to, um, to teach and to minister to 2,000 pastors. These pastors sometimes travel for days to get to this conference. And I was invited to come last year. They had the advertising out. And then I just, I just felt I couldn't make it, just could not do it. This year, I've, I've prayed about this and even though the departure date is just two weeks away, I, um, I feel like this is something God wants me to do. I'm only going to be there for, for four days. And people say, well, that's a quick trip. You're not going to be able to see anything. I'm, going, I'm only going to see one thing, and that is the Holy Spirit move on 2,000 men. I'm not going for sightseeing. I'm going to see God move. Um, so I am I'm heading out in two weeks. I'll, I'll just be gone four days, and I'll be right back. In fact, I looked at my schedule this year, and I'm probably here on Sunday more than I have been in years, and I'm just so excited about what God's going to do right here. This is, I said, this is the year of discipleship. Are you excited about that? And here's what I need. I need, I need to ask your help because I'm, I represent you. I, I'm, um, I go as an extension of this church. What is the command of us to all of us? that have received the Holy Spirit. It says, you shall be my witnesses in, say it with me, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. I'm about to go to the uttermost parts of the earth, and I'm going to represent you there. That's what I can tell you. And uh, I'll be talking about this church, what God's doing here, what God has spoken to us as a body, and I believe that it's going to transform people's lives. I'm going to ask the ushers to come, and if you can help, to send your missionary to, uh, to preach and to minister to these pastors, then I would certainly um, thank God that we could do this together. Let's pray. Father, Lord, it is not my idea of fun to get on a plane and go around the world for four days. It's not my idea of a vacation, but Lord, I... I look forward to this more than any vacation. I look forward to the joy of this more than any trip I could take because I understand that as soon as my feet hit the ground there, Lord, I'll be running, doing one meeting after another, speaking into the lives of these precious pastors from all over Zimbabwe. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will provide the way and the means. I have no means to go other than you providing through your people. And I ask, oh God, that we will all be able to stand before you one day and say, yes, we do have a harvest from Shreveport. But Father God, we also have a harvest to lay at your feet from Zimbabwe. 
because Pastor Denny didn't do this on his own. We did it together. And Father, we just give you the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. How many of you have your notes? If you have your notes, raise, raise your hand. You have your notes? How many of you don't have your notes? Raise your hand if you don't have your notes. Please put your hand up if you don't have your notes. All right? We're going to make sure that, uh, that, that you get notes here. All right? Praise the Lord. Okay. We, um, we are so excited and proud of what God has done through Darrell Tuberville's life, aren't we? And Pastor Darrell has written it all down. Isn't this amazing? How many of you have this book? Raise your hand if you have this book. Isn't this exciting? Well, if you don't have it, listen to me. After the service, you're going to have an opportunity to to purchase this book out in the foyer and Pastor Durrell is going to sign it for you, okay? So Pastor Durrell will sign this book for you and you can, you can purchase it out in the foyer. This helps him to meet his medical expenses and man, this book is going to be a huge blessing for you. You talk about a rapid read, this is a book you won't be able to put down. Living the miracle. Living the miracle. Amen. Well, let's all stand one more time. Everybody stand one more time. Got to get your exercise. That's one of your New Year's resolutions, getting your exercise. I want to speak to you on the subject of the three baptisms. The three baptisms baptisms. Father, this is what I pray, that you will touch us all, that you will bless us. And the Lord, as we talk about from your scripture, the three baptisms, we will understand this is exactly what we need. And we give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. When I was uh, 16 years old, God radically changed my life. He said, well, you got saved. No, I had already been born again. Well, you got baptized in water. No, I had already been baptized in water. But I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. All I can tell you is that from that very point, Everything radically changed in my world. In fact, without the third baptism, I am not sure at all that I would have been able to surrender my life to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Without the third baptism, I'm not sure at all that I would have the word, the love for the word of God that I have today. All three baptisms are very important, but I can tell you that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is one baptism that you must not leave out. This is a very re religious community, and almost everybody you meet in our community will tell you that they know Jesus, that they've been baptized in water. But there is a very basic understanding in the scripture that there's not just one baptism or two, but there are three dynamic baptisms that we all need to be aware of. Let's go to the scripture because we must have a thorough scriptural understanding of these baptisms. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do is to take notes. You say, why should I take notes, Pastor? Because my mission is not to minister to the city, yours is. And when you begin to explain the baptism of the Holy Spirit to individuals, you need to understand what you're talking about. Today is your lucky day. 
Because if you will take notes and you will pay careful attention to what is being said, you will be able to explain in detail through the scriptures the doctrine of the three baptisms. Let's start. First of all, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into Jesus. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into Jesus. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says this, For we were all baptized by one Spirit, capital S, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. You see, when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, when you repented of your sins, you asked him to come into your heart, the scripture refers to that as you being baptized by the Spirit into Jesus Christ, into the body of Jesus Christ. Secondly, disciples baptize us in water. Matthew 28, 19 says, therefore go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is talking about water baptism. It's talking about someone who is immersed in water. Now, you may have been baptized as an infant. That won't work according to the scriptures. That's a wonderful time for your family to get together and celebrate the baby. But it is not scriptural baptism. Scriptural baptism has to take place after you've repented. In other words, it's a very intentional and deliberate act where you say, I have given my life to Jesus Christ. I have repented of my sins and my old life is over. I am ready to live a new life. Baptism is a wonderful thing and it doesn't just happen in a church. I can remember at Louisiana Tech, I had the privilege of baptizing students in the school swimming pool. That was quite a trip. People would come to, um, to swim and they found that the pool was closed and there we were having a baptismal service. Uh, Rick Berlin was baptized in that Louisiana Tech swimming pool. I also remember when I was playing professional football, I played all night against a young man who was going to be an all pro for the Denver Broncos named Steve Foley. Steve was a great football player and a greater guy. Well, a fellow that I'd led to Christ had gone from my team to Steve Foley's team in the pros and had led him to Christ and also led one of the great defensive tackles on that team to the Lord. And after uh, the game was over and I played against Steve Foley, I played wide receiver the first half of the game and then I finished the game at quarterback because our quarterback got hurt. But that first half of the game was totally unproductive because I felt like Steve Foley was suffocating me. I could not get open on a pass right. He was a great football player. After the game was over, Steve and the fellow I'd led to the Lord and the big defensive tackle went back to the apartment where they lived. They were all single young men in those days. And at about 2 a.m., we had a baptismal service in their apartment swimming pool. And I baptized all of them. You see, the fact is you don't have to be a preacher uh, to baptize someone. And your baptism is still good even if the priest doesn't do it. As long as you're a disciple, you can baptize someone in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the third baptism. Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. There are only a few things that appear in all four Gospels. The first three Gospels are synoptic Gospels. That is, they are very much alike. They deal with the same span of time. John departs from that pattern, and he shares with us things about Jesus and the gospel and the first days of the kingdom of God that we would never know otherwise. But there are four things that are in all of the gospels, and here they are. The first is the death of Jesus. The second is the burial of Jesus. The third is the resurrection of Jesus. And the fourth is the baptism in the Holy Spirit of Jesus. Let's, let's turn right now to those Gospels 
Now let me show you this third baptism, this baptism in the Holy Spirit in all four Gospels. Matthew 3 and 11 says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Here's Mark chapter 1, verse 8, the second gospel. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Luke 3, 16. John answered them all. I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And then in the book of John, it's a little bit different, but it's the same exact component of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Then John gave this testimony, John 1, 32 and 34. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I've seen and testify that this is God's chosen one. Now, let me explain this to you for a moment. The Holy Spirit had always descended on certain individuals throughout history. But he had never remained on anyone on a constant basis. No one in all of history had ever been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit in a constant and continual fashion. You remember the story of Saul. Saul was anointed by God. The Holy Spirit was certainly with him. But when he defied the protocol of worship and he offended God, God lifted his Holy Spirit from him. It did not remain. Of course, David, man after God's own heart, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he was one who wrote the beautiful psalms of praise. And yet, when he so offended God and he, he slept with Bathsheba, who was another man's wife, and then had that man killed to cover up his sin, the Word of God says that his prayer of repentance in Psalm 51 was this, please, do not remove your Holy Spirit from me. But when the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, Jesus would be filled with the Holy Spirit on a constant and continual basis. In fact, the Holy Spirit, of course, was the one who brought him into the world. He experienced what we know as birth of the Spirit. But he was never born again because he was born right the first time. Can somebody say amen? The Word of God says in Matthew 1.18, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant, listen to this, through the Holy Spirit. Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit, just like we are born of the Spirit when we are born again. Secondly, he, Jesus, was baptized in water by John the Baptist. Remember when Jesus came into the water with John the Baptist and John said, what are you, what are you doing being baptized by me? I, I can't let that happen. I, it's sudden, it, his eyes were suddenly opened. He understood who Jesus was. He was overwhelmed with the fear of God and, and he was in such awe of Jesus. Jesus was his first cousin. He, he probably had played with him as a child, but suddenly through the revelation of the Holy Spirit, he saw him in a brand new way and he said, you should be baptizing me. And Jesus made this statement. It's a very key statement. He said, said, suffer to be so now because I need to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, Jesus was saying, this is an important moment and you are going to baptize me because I have got to set the pattern for those to come. So Jesus is baptized in water. And then the word of God says, 
that the Holy Spirit descended upon him and remained. There you have the three baptisms. Now, what happens to us when we experience the three baptisms? What exactly happens? Well, when the Holy Spirit baptizes us into Jesus, the Bible says we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. If you're glad that you're a new creature in Christ, say amen. You see, some of you think that being a Christian is deciding to be good. You don't even get it. There are no good people here. We, we are all dirt balls. Every one of us. Every one of us. However, came to a place where we had a supernatural, say supernatural. Transformation, say transformation. The moment we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Our values changed when we were baptized into Christ. And, and that's why there's such confusion. You know, I'd like to go to church with you. You know, I really need to clean my act up. Well, this isn't the place to do that. We're not people who can tell you how to clean your act up. But we can tell you how to come just filthy before the throne of Almighty God and to bow at the cross of Jesus and to have him cleanse you with his blood so that what you could not do in cleaning your act up, he did by transforming you with one touch. We know about that in this house. You're baptized into Christ. Um, when we're baptized in water, our old nature is rendered dead. Some of you have been casual and not quite so concerned about baptism. Let me say this to you. As surely as repent is a command of God, right beside it is baptism. Be baptized. Everyone here, if you have given your life to Jesus, need to be water, say water, water. baptized after your repentance. Now, you may have grown up in a church and walked the aisle, never really gave your life to Jesus, got baptized, and then later on you really meet Jesus and you say, well, you know, I was baptized way back then. That's no good. Because baptism needs to come after your repentance. And if you have not been baptized, then you don't understand the importance of the second baptism. You see, the second baptism is the declaration to the world that we have been buried and resurrected with Christ Jesus. That is, our old nature, our old life is dead. See, if there hasn't been a separation between your old life and your new life, you don't have a new life. And that's why it's important to be one who's experienced the first baptism, baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit, transformed, made a new creature, but then the second baptism, that you might be immersed so that when you're immersed, you are declaring, I am leaving the old life behind. And when you approach baptism with faith in your heart, there is a supernatural element of baptism. It's not because the water is supercharged. It's just because Faith connects with the fact that the old you is over. And the new you, the one that lives under the reign of Jesus Christ, is alive. And here's the third baptism. When we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, we receive power to live out everything that God commands us to do and be. The Holy Spirit is is power. Mm. I said the Holy Spirit is power. Mm. Come on, say that with me. Ready? You got to do the mm too. Ready? Everybody. The Holy Spirit is power. Mm. That's it. You kind of got to feel that, right? But you will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. In Acts 1 and 4, turn there with me, please. Jesus gives this promise. The Bible says on one occasion while he was eating with them. Do you understand why we believe that Jesus is resurrected? 
because we have eyewitness accounts available for us of those who actually fellowshiped with him. They didn't see him as like some mirage or some fleeting shadow. Oh, <laughs> resurrection sighting. No. They sat down and ate with him. They spent, they spent 50 days with him after the resurrection. He, he sat down, talked with them as a resurrected man. Did, did that dawn on you? He had nails prints in his hands. Still the scars on his brow from crucifixion. And he's in their houses laughing with them, enjoying them. On one occasion, he cooked fish for them. Imagine that. Jesus comes to see you and says in his resurrected body, just go sit down, I'm doing dinner. And here the Bible says that he was sitting with them, eating with them. And he gave them this command as they're just around the table with him. He said, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my fa that, that my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. And in Acts chapter 2, that's what they were doing. They, they went and they just waited in Jerusalem. What were you waiting for? They didn't know. They'd only experienced the first two baptisms. They had been baptized into Christ. They were witnesses of the resurrection. They were committed to his lordship. For three and a half years, he had walked with them and taught them and shaped them. They were believers. They had been baptized into Jesus. They had also been baptized in water. But this third baptism was something that they really didn't know a lot about. They were just waiting as he told them to wait. They were just waiting for the third baptism baptism. And the Word of God says in Acts chapter 2 that while they were in one mind, say one mind, and one accord, say one accord, there came suddenly the sound of a rushing mighty wind. Now that made sense to the Jewish mind. And the reason why is because in Ezekiel there had been a prophecy that God was going to eventually bring life back to the Jewish people. And that the way he was going to bring life is that he was going to send a wind of his breath from the north, south, east, and west. The wind was going to come and a valley of dry bones, which is the way that Ezekiel saw in his vision the people of God being dead and dry and having no ability to really live life or accomplish anything of importance. He said the wind would come and they would all to life. So the wind came into this room in Jerusalem where they're waiting and they're thinking in their minds, I'm sure, oh, this must be the wind of Ezekiel. And then they look around and the word of God says, and cloven tongues like as a fire set upon each of them. Now, immediately, I'm sure that their minds went to the fire of the tabernacle, of the temple. You see, they understood in their history books that when Moses built an ark for God to dwell in. That there was a celestial torch that, that rose from that box all the way into the heavens. It was a supernatural sign of the supernatural presence of God. But of course, that torch had been gone for generations. And now they look around and they see the celestial torch on each of the heads of those that are in the upper room and it dawns on their Jewish minds. Wow. So God is no longer in the box. Hallelujah. They said God is now on all of us. We are all the ark of the covenant. You see what you got to understand is this. God has no dwelling place on earth but you and he wants to manifest in great power in your life. And the Word of God says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. You say, why is that so? Because it's number one in the Bible. But number two, it's so logical. 
Because how many of you understand that the one member of your body that you cannot tame is your tongue? Well, here's what happens. The very first thing that the Holy Spirit does when he opens up shop is that he says, I'm taking over the sanctification of the tongue. Suddenly, your limited speech is no longer limited. You are able to pray in your understanding. But boy, when you get to that ceiling, you don't have to worry because the Word of God says He will give you a prayer language so that then you are able to pray in what the Word of God says, the Spirit. And then when you pray in the Spirit, you speak mysteries, but the Bible says you don't speak to man, but you speak directly to God. So the devil's giving you a hard time. Your flesh is giving you a hard time. You feel like <coughs> that you're surrounded by the devil and all of his emissaries and you're praying and you feel like he's fighting your prayers so you just lift your hands and you kick into the language of the Holy Ghost now the devil's frustrated because he's got to sit over in the corner he has no idea what you're saying because you've got a direct pipeline to Almighty God and he begins to work and to move in your life in extraordinary and supernatural ways all I can tell you is the baptism in the Holy Spirit is for real and everybody needs to be baptized in the Holy Spirit Now, I'm going to show you throughout the Scripture, and it won't take me but just a few minutes, a handful of minutes, how that you see these three baptisms everywhere. Now, Peter said this. He said, this promise is unto you, your children, and to as many as and to those that are afar off, and to as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, how in the world do some preachers and theologians say that this was only for the apostles of the first generation church? Where in the world does that come from? Peter said, this promise is to as many as the Lord our God shall call. Anybody in that number? It's for you. And don't you ever let some dead, dry theologian try to take the promise of the power of the Holy Ghost from you. It belongs to you. Thank God it belongs to me and it changed my life. And I can tell you it will change your life as well. Hallelujah. Now, um, The Word of God says in Acts 2 that there are three baptisms available. Peter says this. He says, repent. Everybody say, baptism into Jesus. Be baptized. Everybody say, baptized in water. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Everyone say, baptized in the Spirit. Now, the Word of God says in Acts 8, let's turn there please, Acts 8. There's a great revival in Samaria and there's a young evangelist by the name of Philip who is preaching and he has such power and such anointing. He was there I'm sure at the day of Pentecost and he'd been filled with the Spirit of God and he was preaching. And so he preaches Jesus to them. And in verse 12 it says, But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, the word of God says they believed. Everybody say, baptized into Jesus. This is what the word of God says. Both men and women were baptized. Everyone say, baptized in water. Now let's move down to verse 14. When the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had welcomed God's message, they sent Peter and John to them. After they went down there, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now listen to this. For he had not yet come down on any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then... 
Everybody say then. Peter and John laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Say baptized in the Holy Spirit. You see, those are the three baptisms. Now turn with me, please, to Acts 19. There are other passages I could go to, but time won't allow me to do that. But I think we can get a great scriptural foundation just from these passages. I hope you're writing all of this down because you need to be able to explain this to your friends and family members. Amen? And you'll be able to do it as well as I'm doing it or better because you're going to have more practice, okay? Now, chapter 19. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions and came to Ephesus. He found some disciples. Everybody say disciples. Say baptized into Jesus. And ask them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And this reminds me of a whole lot of churches and it's very sad. No, they told him, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. I wish they could have been with me at Pastor Keith Crafts the last three nights when 1,000 to 1,500 people were baptized in the Holy Spirit simply because they ask. It was one of the most powerful, glorious visitations that I have ever seen. Now, they told him, we haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. Then with what baptism were you baptized? He asked them, with John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people that they should believe in the one who would come after him, that is, in Jesus. You know how powerful Jesus is? Jesus was able to get people to believe in him before he even started his public ministry. Because that's what the Word of God says right here. Now, on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Say water baptism. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak with tongues and to prophesy. Somebody say baptized in the Holy Spirit. You see, those are three distinct baptisms. They believed. They were baptized in water. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, in 1 John 5, 7, turn there with me, please. 1 John 5, 7. The Bible says there are three that testify in heaven. I want, I want you to underline this in your Bible for the same reason, because I want you to be able to skillfully use the Word of God to explain these truths. Amen. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, someone say, baptized in the Holy Spirit, the water, someone say, Baptized into G, uh, baptized in water, and the blood. Someone say baptized into Jesus, and these three are in agreement. Now, turn me please to First Corinthians ten and two. I want to show you a picture of these three baptisms that have been intact from long before Jesus even came to the earth. 1 Corinthians 10 and 2 says, talking about the children of Israel, it says they were all baptized into Moses. Somebody say, baptized into Jesus because Moses was the forerunner of Jesus. They were all baptized in the cloud. Say, somebody say, baptized in the spirit. And they were all baptized in the sea. Someone say, baptized in water. You see, the fact is, there are three baptisms that are very clear in this Bible. And God says, you should have them all. You say, well, are you telling me if I don't have all three that I'm not ready to go to heaven? No, no, no. When you repent, you're ready to go to heaven. God will never love you more than when you just ask Jesus into your life. But... If you want to be a disciple, this is the year of discipleship. You need three baptisms. 
If you really want to be a disciple, you need three baptisms. You need to be baptized into Jesus. You need to be baptized in water. And you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, folks, let me just say something to you. I know that being baptized in the Holy Spirit has gotten a, a bad name because people get in the flesh and they do all kind of strange, weird things and they put it on the Lord's tab. But I can tell you is this. You need to be proud of the fact that you attend a church that preaches the full message of discipleship, that we are baptized into Jesus in water and in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for joining us. We hope this message has equipped and encouraged you. For current events and other resources, visit ccpeople.com. And remember, the best is yet to come.